Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, last time we did a study on, not last time, but a couple times ago we did a study on why the love of the brethren has waxed cold. And I gave homework for Psalms 141. And God put on my heart, I was going to sit by the fire, I got the fire, <laughs> the wood stove going. I was going to sit by the fire and we were going to do just a psalm by the, the fireside. But God put on my heart, we haven't done an expository study in a while, so we're going to do an expository study on Psalms 141, the homework that I gave, okay, that I want you guys to read. And we're going to be talking about several things, but we're all going to bring it back for the main subject of that study of why the love of the brethren is wax cold, is because of correction. Brethren don't communicate. They cut ties too quickly. They don't love, truly love their brother and sister Christ by trying to correct them and get them back on the right path taking correction and giving correction okay doing bible studies together when there's disagreements you do bible studies together you make sure that we're all on the same page i'm getting ahead of myself a little bit but we did that study and i gave psalms 40 uh 141 as homework because king david feels the same way and we're going to get into this but before we do i want to start this with a hymn but remember to get out your king james bibles okay this is a king james bible believing god fearing ministry Right. This is God's perfect written word of God. This is the foundation on which you can hold me accountable to and I can hold you accountable to. Following 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing, of course. Rightly dividing the word of truth. But this is what our foundation is. So get your King James Bibles out and get ready to go. But I want to sing the hymn day by day. It just seems in these last days, things are times are getting a little bit harder. The brethren are falling away. Uh, there's so much division in the body of Christ today. I'm of so-and-so, too much respecter of persons, and just not much actual love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And we've talked about more of that in that study, about why the love of the brethren is waxing cold, because sin abounds, iniquity abounds. So if you haven't watched that study, go watch that study. But I want to start this with a hymn, Day by Day. Okay, Our walk with the Lord, our fellowship with the brethren, day by day. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment. I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure, Gives unto each day what he deems best, loving its part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me, with the special mercy for each hour. All my cares he gladly bears to cheer me. He whose name is Counselor and Power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As your days your strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, Heir to take us from thy Father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, Till I reach the promised land. Day by day, brother, sis Christ, and it's the Word of God. Make sure you're spending day by day in this book right here. In the Word of God, in prayer, we're going to get into this a little more in here, in prayer, Okay. In your fellowship with the brethren, taking time out and making sacrifices for the brethren to spend time with them in fellowship to help one another out. So we talked about homework, Psalms 141. 
because we ran out of time to get through it in the other study. So today we're going to do an expository study on Psalms 141 for homework. And the main topic was, why is the love of the brethren wax cold? And we got in there and we started talking about, because iniquity, where Paul talks about, uh, the more I love you, the less I am loved. The more I hold you accountable to this book, to God's standards, what God says is right and wrong for today, when what God says is sin, period, for every dispensation, but what God says is right for today, this right here, the more he loves him, the less he is loved. And there's times where he's like, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And the brethren, they're not showing much love for one another. And they're starting to act like you're treating each other like enemies. Why? Because this is not our final authority anymore. It should be. But do you guys remember before the flood? Before the flood, the Bible says men did what was right in their own eyes. This isn't in my notes. We're going to get into this. But men did what was right in their own eyes. Then you get through the story and you get through Exodus and you get Moses and he's writing down the Levitical laws, what's called the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through uh, Deuteronomy. All right? And he's writing down the Levitical laws, the holy days, the Sabbath days, the new moon, the touch not, the taste not, the eat not. He's got circumcision in the law. They call it the circumcision in the laws of Moses, but the Levitical laws. Okay, God's commandments are getting written down. The laws of God that were on every man's heart going back to Adam and Eve when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it put the laws of God on every man's heart. So it was just on their heart before the flood, and if they wanted to ignore that, the laws of God that are written on their heart, the way they ignored it was every man did what's right in their own eyes. So then Moses comes along and we get God's word written down, and you get to the book of Judges, and what happens? People have a problem with this. And what do they do? They go back to doing what's right in their own eyes. It mentions that in the book of Judges. People were doing right what's right in their own eyes. What's going on today? Brethren, it seems like the brethren as a whole are getting tired of this being the final authority. They're getting tired of actually quoting what the Bible actually says. We've got a lot of professing, professing Bible believers professing brethren that are adding to and subtracting from this book. They profess that they're Bible believers. They profess that this is the foundation. But for the most part, what's causing the division is you have a lot of the brethren are starting to go back to their old, like the old man, trying to resurrect the old man like Paul said not to do. And what's happening is you're, you're starting to go back to doing what's right in your own eyes. It's no longer thus saith the Lord. It's no longer chapter and verse. Being a brand, it's we do what's right in our own eyes. So then someone, a godly man, or we're going to talk about this, a righteous man, a holy man of God, comes along and says, Thus saith the Lord, here's the chapter and verse, what you're doing is wrong. What you're pushing is wrong. What you're promoting is wrong. You're not pleasing God, you're pleasing yourself. You're not pleasing God, you're pleasing the world and the people around you. You can be calling someone sin out. You can be calling a false teaching out. But what's happening is people are falling back to that old way of doing things, the fleshly, world, sinful, wicked world's way of doing things of, we'll do what's whatever's right in our own eyes. Okay? And when correction comes along, brethren aren't taking correction. They love to give it. I'm getting ahead of myself. They love to give it, but they don't love to take it. And that's what that whole study was about, how we need to start loving one another and be open to taking correction that this is the final authority and that there's no sin or worldliness, covetousness, idolatry, worldliness that's worth coming between your walk with the Lord, coming between you and your fellowship with the brethren, coming between you being a light to this dark world when it comes to being a living witness and a verbal witness. Nothing. Okay? And I wanted to get in here because what this is key, we're going to talk about King David. Okay? Psalms 141.1, how it starts out, says a psalm of David. How did King David look at taking correction and giving correction? This is a man who's a great warrior. This is a man, we're going to get into this, a man after God's own heart. This is a man that became a king. He's a, the greatest judge of Israel outside of God. How about down here? What was his attitude on taking correction, let alone giving it? 
Our problem today, brother, says Christ, is we love to correct people, but we don't like taking correction. I'm getting ahead of myself. But right here it says, uh, Psalms 141.1, a psalm of David. Maybe you keep your hands there, because you can always pause the video and turn, because we're going to go through a lot of scripture, but we're always going to come back to psalms. That's what expository study is, and we're going to go through verse by verse. But a psalm of David, 1 Samuel 13.14, 1 Samuel 13, 14 says, but, no, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. He's talking to Saul. Thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. This is Samuel rebuking Saul. And Samuel has the Holy Spirit of God in him. It's God rebuking Saul through Samuel. I have sought him a man after his own heart. He's talking about a man that's after God's heart. A man that loves all through the Psalms, King David's talking about how I love thy commandments. I love thy word. That's where we get the verse, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking, taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Thy words are pure words, therefore thy servant loveth it. And that's just, a, I'm just barely chiseling the top. There's tons of verses on how how King David was pushing in the Psalms how we're supposed to be after God. His word, his way, what pleases him first and foremost. What does right by him, not this wicked world, not this wicked body of flesh. We're supposed to do what's right by God first. And how do we know what to do what's right by God? His word. So we're supposed to be after God's heart. This is a man after God's own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. See how that goes hand in hand? He's talking about, Saul, you didn't do what God commanded you, but I'm going to get a man after my own heart. What does that mean? A man that will do what I command him. A man that will put God first, put his way first, put God's word first. How do we know that? Acts 13.22. A retelling, Acts 13.22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David. After he removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them, Israel, David, to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. King David, when he, he did fail the Lord, when he did his own will, when he started being a man after his own heart, not after God's heart, but after his own heart, in the, in the, in the situation with Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba, where he com committed fornication and had a man murdered, he wasn't doing the will of God. But predominantly his whole life, his heart was for the Lord. And when he got corrected on that matter, his heart was broken for what he did. Okay? But it says here, I found King David a man after my own heart, which means shall fulfill all my will. When you have a man that's after God's heart, your heartfelt desire is God comes first. His word comes first. His way comes first. It's about pleasing God first, not your, not your wife. Sisters in Christ, God first, not your husband. You can please your wife and your husband as long as it doesn't go against the word of God. God comes first. But when you're pleasing your wife or your husband or your children or your neighbors or extended family or your people that you work with, compromising to the world to get along with the world, you're not pleasing God first. You're making God take a back seat. You're not a person after God's own heart. Right. A man that's after God's own heart, King David, was a man that loved God's word, loved his will, loved his commandments, and did everything he could to follow him. And he did end up breaking them a couple times. Okay, Psalms 51. It also, not that saying he wasn't perfect, but one of the major times, the only major time the Bible talks about King David letting God down was with, the, with Uriah the Hittite. Okay, uh, Committing adultery and having a man murdered to cover it up. Psalms 51.10 says, Create 51.10. Psalms 51.10. This is King David. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. A clean heart? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. How do you have a clean heart? By replacing all the worldly, sinful, wicked junk with this right here. 
with what pleases God. God's way of doing things. God's word that you hide in your heart. That's how you create me a clean heart. Lord, wash all the bad stuff out and help me fill it up with good stuff. Now the Bible talks about the heart. The heart of man is wicked continually. The imagination of man's heart is only wicked continually. We've got to put the flesh down and we've got to start putting God's word in our heart. Acts 8.21, that's the kind of man King David was. He wanted to do things God's way. And we're going to find out, I'm getting ahead of myself, that if he wasn't doing things God's way, the correction that he wanted was from this. Now, in his day, they did have writings down. They had, like I said, Moses had a lot of writings, the laws, the liturgical laws and everything. He wanted correction from God on his word. If he wasn't doing something God's way, he wanted to know it. Why? Because he was a man after God's own heart. What happened to that attitude in these last days with the professing brothers and sisters in Christ out there? We see them in error. We see them that they're wrong. We come to them with the Word of God. What's their attitude? Why don't they have that attitude of, if I'm wrong, I want to be corrected? Now, please, I have to do a little, like, what do you like, a clause or a... Um, little side note, I understand the enemy can act that out and say that, oh yeah, I want to be correct to you. Yeah, Words and deed need to line up. With King David, most of his deeds line up with his words. He wanted the truth, he wanted to live the truth, and he wanted to be corrected when he was wrong. And he was corrected several times. Okay? In the latter book of uh, Samuels, and 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, he was corrected a lot. Several times. Right. Acts 8.21 says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. His heart's not right in the sight of God? In other words, his heart's not for God's way, his heart's for the world's way. God doesn't come first. Either me, myself, and I, you know, the self-entity. The self-entity... The pride, the selfishness, or someone in this world comes first, or something in this world comes first before God. Your heart isn't right with Him. And that's what I've always said. I've called out some brethren and told them that your heart's not right with the Lord. Why? Because God doesn't come first in your life anymore. His Word's not the final authority in your life anymore. So when you hear me say that, you know, I, I don't really do it publicly, I'll do it one-on-one -on -one with brethren when I tell them, hey, your heart's not right with the Lord. Something down here is becoming more important than someone up there. And I know it's easier to say it, but their actions, your deeds are proven. Some people can try to hide it by good words and fair speeches deceiving the hearts of the simple, but when they get backed into a corner, the truth comes out. King David was a man after God's own heart. His desire was God's way. God's truth, which is the only truth. Romans 10.8 says, Romans 10.8 says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. It's not just in your mouth, it's not just words you say, but when it's in your heart, you're living it. King David was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't just saying that he loved God's word. His life proved that he loved God's word. That God's way comes first. Can you still fail the Lord? Yes, King David did. But his overall life, when you did an evaluation of his overall life, he chose the Lord 99, 90 to 99% of the time. We're all sinners. We all fail the Lord at times. But do you take the correction, come to God broken, repent, and then forsake? And get, your, and get your heart right with the Lord and get back to living for the Lord. That's what getting your heart right with the Lord is. Where you get back to doing what's right according to God and His Word. Not according to feelings and opinions and doing what's right in your own eyes. In thy heart, thy word is neither even in thy mouth and in thy heart. It's got to be in both places. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that's the mouth, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. That's with the heart. Thou shalt be saved. For with the 
Heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Today it's repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You confess both in prayer. The confession needs to come from the heart, not just head knowledge, but from the heart. And you ask God to save you, and then God will save you. But I want to throw in there about the heart thing. It's always a heart issue with the Lord. It's not a head issue. It's not a I can use good words and fair speeches issue. It always comes down to a heart issue. God looks at the heart. And um, Hebrews, when it talks about the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it, it pierces asunder, and it knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. This pierces the heart. This goes to the heart of the matter. The heart of the issue, you hear people say. Right? It's always a heart issue, and King David was a man after God's own heart. In other words, he wanted to live and do things God's way. He commands his whole, his whole life is, I want to obey God. I want to obey God. I want to please God. This is important, because we're going to get to the verse where he talks about taking correction. He has a verse where he gives it, and he has a verse where he takes it. Someone who loves the Lord and wants to do things God's way is not above taking correction. And today with the body of Christ, it's all about social club. Uh, even on YouTube and online, I'm of this person, I'm of that person, and you're part of some big, huge social club, and we forgot that we're all supposed to be held accountable to this. And we're not supposed to be following this man and doing what he thinks is best. This man, let's, let's say me, I'll point at me, I'm pointing at the camera. This man is supposed to be doing things God's way. Does he line up with this book? If he doesn't, I need to go talk to him and try to help him line up with this book. A lot of people don't talk to me that much these days anymore. Why? Because I always say chapter and verse. I'm getting ahead of myself. I always say chapter and verse. When there's a lot of division, most of our division comes from adding to and subtracting from the Word of God. Not taking it in context, there's that there a little bit, not rightly dividing the word of truth, in other words. But for the most part, you can pretty much solve a lot of the division in the body of Christ by just simply saying chapter and verse where the Bible actually says what you just said. That's actually teaching what you just taught. You can solve a lot of problems that way. The reason we have a lot of division is people are forsaking this and going off of, if it feels good, do it. They do what's right in their own eyes. You know? So I want to start this with, a, I know it just says the Psalm of David, what kind of man he was as we're going through this. A man after God's own heart is a man who wants to do things God's way and obey God. He wants to please God and he wants to obey God. With the life that he lives, with the, air he, the very air he breathes, his life is all about serving God. So Psalms 14.1, back to, uh, let's keep going. Lord... I cry unto thee, King David's praying, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me, give ear unto my voice. When I cry unto thee, let my prayer, so when he's crying unto him, I'm getting a little ahead of myself again, uh, the word call, people always try to fight and say, well call just means believe. No call is prayer, it's call is asking God something. Okay. Let my prayer be set forth before thee. He says, Lord, I cry unto thee. I make haste unto me. Make, and make haste unto me to give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. That's what calling is. When it talks about the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Yeah. Let my prayer be set before, forth before thee as incense and lifting up of my hands as evening sacrifice. You know why we lift up our hands? I used to do it in the battle building system. Oh, you get so into the mu emotional music and it's all fleshly and you're trying to reach out and touch God. You know why? It's this, this says lifting up hands, plural. Okay. When a cop pulls a gun on you and says freeze, what's the first thing you do? Get your hands up. What is it? It's a sign of surrender. I give up. You know how you usually look at wave the white flag? But when you raise your hands, it's a sign of surrender. I give up. When they're lifting up holy hands to God, what they're saying is, is I surrender. It's your way. I'm wrong. You're right. 
My way when it is not right, I, my way needs to be your way. Not the flesh's way, not the world's way. I surrender. Now you have so many, like these worldly, uh, emotional style, like emote music, uh, worship songs like, I surrender all. But they're not surrendering nothing. It's still all about them doing what's right in their own eyes. Putting the flesh first, the world first, the Babel building system first, rudiments of the world, traditions of men. Okay? When you raise up your hands, it's you saying, humbling yourself, saying, I surrender. Uh, there's that old hymn that says, as you're all on the altar of sacrifice laid. Peter says we're supposed to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, without blemish, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Did you surrender all? Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Did you give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross? Surrender. As a life as a Christian, there's times where I can fall back into trying to resurrect the old man. I can get tempted. I, I get tempted, and sometimes it's my fault. I give in to the temptations. What do I have to do? I have to repent. I've got to surrender. Lord, I was wrong. So it's not just for lost getting saved, it's also for a saved brother and sister Christ in the life of a Christian. There's times where you start getting prideful, you start getting puffed up, and you need to remember that you need to surrender sometimes. You've taken over, and you pushed God to the side, and you made His Word take a back seat, and you need to come back and you need to surrender all over again. And start back over and say, okay, this is the final authority, it's supposed to be the final authority, and I need to start living that way. He's lifting up his hands. I just want to make that a big point. It's surrender. It's not some emotional, make me feel good type thing. It's hard. It's humbling. I surrender. But he says, Lord, I cry unto thee. Genesis 4.26, this is the first time it says this, And to Seth, Tim also were born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Call means ask. I need help with this. Lord, what should I do here? I don't know what, what's going on there. Lord, I'm fearful. I need help. I need saving. I need protection. And so on and so on. Romans 10.11 says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Ask him to save you. One of the biggest things that I get in a fight with some people is they've never even asked God to save them. And they're supposed to be a brother and sister. You're not my brother and sister in Christ if you refuse to ask God to save you. Repentance toward... And most of the time when they won't ask God to save them, prayer. Oh no, call just means believe. Believe. They replace repentance with belief. Repentance, going from unbelief to belief. Then there's belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then where it says we have to pray and confess both in prayer and ask God to save us. No, that just call just means believe. So it's just believe, believe, believe. So they, they take repentance out, true biblical repentance, and they take prayer out. You're not saved. And you'll never get saved that way. But for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, what's King David doing? He's crying unto the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Brothers and Christ, your prayer life is very important. Your Bible reading life is good, it's important. Studying the Bible is important, but your prayer life is just as important. You need to have a strong prayer life. You need to have a strong Bible reading life, where you're starting your day with the Word of God, you're ending your day with the Word of God. You need to take time out once, at least once a week to do a solid Bible study, whether you're watching one and following along, or you're doing one yourself. You need to study the Word of God. Okay? You need to have a, this is what it means to have a solid walk with the Lord. Not just, when, I, when we say study, because I've always got to point this out, you can read the Word of God and it won't mean anything. It's important to start out by reading the Word of God. Newly saved, babe in Christ, I started forcing myself to read the Word of God. But at some point as you're learning, you need to take what you learn that applies to us today, the time of the Gentiles, the body of Christ for today, if if it applies to us, we need to start including it in our life. One of the things is prayer. We need to really start including it in our life. You need to have a strong prayer life. 
And we talked about that in other study that the, one of the things about sin is it's destructive, it's negative, and one of the things it does is it hinders your prayer life. It hinders your Bible reading and Bible studying life. It gets you to put all that to the side because you're distracted by the flesh, by sin and wickedness. But we're to pray without ceasing. Look at King David when he, 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 he went to the Lord. When he needed something, for the most part, he went to the Lord. There was times he didn't. He should have. But for the most part, when he needed something, he went to the Lord. When he wanted to praise God, he went to the Lord. You know, that always gets me. P today people are like, well, we got to go to a Bible building to praise God. No, you, I just praise God in a hymn. I can sit here and talk with the Lord and praise Him and give Him thanks. You do that wherever you are. But you're to pray without ceasing. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. He wants to hear from you. James 1, 5, for instruction in righteousness, not doctrine, it's instruction in righteousness. James 1, 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given to him. We go to God with our requests when we need something, whether there's something physical down there, protection, food, clothing, uh, help, you know, for family and friends, you know. We go to God with our requests. When we want wisdom, who do we go to? We go to God for wisdom. We're supposed to go to God for wisdom. Some people try to go to the world for wisdom. Some people try to rely on their own wisdom. You know, the wisdom of this world. Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? You learn about that in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What's that reward? You seek God in prayer, saying, Lord, I need help. And God looks at the heart, and he, help, he gives you what you need first and foremost, but there's times where God has given me what I wanted it's not what I need, it's what I wanted, but he'll take care of my needs, but I still ask for him. Why? Because I don't deserve, you know, anybody who's truly gotten saved and born again, we sit here, we don't deserve anything. Even like clothes. God, you created me, you have to give me clothes and, and air to breathe and, and a meal every day. We don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. The man I was before I got saved... Some of the times as a saved sinner, when I failed the Lord even as a saved sinner, I don't deserve it. I still ask for it. Now, no request means, hey, it's something you want. But there's times where I've asked God for something I want. But you know what helps? The more you try to get to know God, the more you know what to pray for. You know, someone who's newly saved can sit there and say, I pray for, you know... A million dollars, a big house, and all this stuff. But as you study the Word of God, and you keep seeking Him, diligently seeking Him, you start knowing who God is, and you start realizing what's important and what's not important. Your prayers seem to line up with this book. I'm not supposed to be praying for a million dollars. I'm not supposed to be praying to live my dream life down here. You know, having my best life now down here. No, I'm supposed to be praying for what's important. I have food, raiment, therewith be content, and praise the Lord for it, and thank Him for it, and ask the Lord for it. Okay. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. This is Paul. I, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. There's that lifting up holy hands. You're surrendering, or your hands holy the works of your hands, the life that you live, does it line up with this? And these battle buildings, when I was a false convert in the faith alone, false gospel battle buildings, uh, I was lifting up dirty hands, wicked hands. I wasn't surrendering. I was just part of like some big raise, like you go to some big concert and everyone's going to raise and going crazy like the lost world. It's fun. It's not funny. I was about to say it's funny, but how a lot of these things that the battle buildings have become line up more with the lost world than they ever do with this. What Paul talking about surrendering and making sure that your life is pleasing to God. You're living a holy life. Be holy, for I am holy. Lifting up holy hands. 
but you pray. It starts with prayer. Lord, open this book to me. You start salvation. Someone preaches the Word of God to you when it comes to the true plan of salvation. You get saved. Your life as a Christian starts after your first prayer when you ask God to save you. And from that point on, it's prayer that's supposed to be the first thing that you need to get down. You need to get that prayer life down. You pray over this book. You pray over your walk with the Lord. You pray for the brethren. You pray for your lost family member and friends, the lost world. A lot of us are praying for that blessed hope. <laughs> that blessed hope. So Psalms 14.1, uh, short about way, he's talking about prayer. He's praying. When there's a problem, he's crying out to the Lord. When there's a problem. How many of you seek the Lord? When you see a problem in your life, do you try to fix it instantly? Or do you try to say, well, it's not that big of a... How many of you, have, it's, it's sometimes it's something you have to work on. Like a good habit, you have to develop a good habit versus a bad habit. The bad habit is, I got this. The bad habit is, I'll solve it my way. The bad habit is, you know, is, it's not really that big of a deal. I can live with it. But a good habit is no matter what's going on in your life, when something doesn't go right, is your first response to fall on your knees and talk with the Lord. Take it to the Lord in prayer. King David's was. Psalms 141.3. Here he is. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. When it said set a watch, it made me think of the blessed hope, how we're looking for the blessed hope. But that's not exactly what this is talking about. It's talking about not us looking for the blessed hope. It's talking about somebody watching over us, how we speak, what we say, how we correct people. Remember that thing about making sure that our mouth lines up with our words, our works, that we're not all talk, we're also talk and walk. Turn to James 3. James 3. I'm in this in my uh, daily. I came through this and like, this is perfect. James 3, verses 1 through 12. We'll start at verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. Now remember, James is the, for the time of Jacob's trouble, but for doctrine... For if many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle his whole body. Remember, offend in word. You can preach the truth, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you can preach the truth and be in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. I can preach the truth in meekness and the truth is offending you, but my words, how I'm presenting the truth, my words aren't what's offending you, it's the truth that's offending you. Now, let's say I'm in 100% in the right, and instead of, I'm, instead of using meekness to instruct those that oppose themselves, I now start using pride, bitterness, hate. I start lifting myself up and putting that person down. In other words, you're attacking the person. You're coming across as a jerk. Now, the truth isn't what's offending them. It's your words that are offending them. Name-calling, mocking, backbiting and whispering, bearing false witness. Present, when you're going to correct somebody, you do it in a way where you're attacking them. I guess the best way I can explain it is, I had a brother in Christ come to me to correct me when I said John, uh, in uh, Revelation, John was exiled to the island of Patmos. Now, here's the two ways you can come. This is what I'm talking about here, where you're not offending with your words. The truth offends, but your words aren't offending. He came to me and said, listen, brother, I heard you say this. And I looked through the scriptures, and I couldn't find it. Could you show me where you found that? Can you show me where you got that at in the scriptures? And I sat there, and I went through, and went, well, it's right, it's right. And I started flipping through, and I'm like, it's not there. Where did I get that? If it's not here, traditions of men. So-and-so said it, and the person before him said it, and the person before him, and hit. you know what I'm saying? And at some point, it got to somebody who'd said it the right way, but someone came along and started perverting it and saying it the wrong way. I was still guilty. I was still wrong. Now, if I was prideful, I could have told him, you know what, I don't care what the Bible says and everything. I'm not offended by what that man said, that brother in Christ said. I'd be offended of the truth, that he made, he made a truthful statement. Where is this at in the Bible? 
It wasn't there. Right? Now here's someone who comes along who's prideful and arrogant. They'll say in the comment section, they're not trying to correct me with meekness. They're not trying to get me back on the right path. They come and say, nowhere in the Bible does it say that John was ever exiled to the island of Patmos. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. You're a heretic. You're a false convert. What is that? Now they're attacking. Name calling, mocking, bearing false witness. What is that? Now they're offending with their words. There's a difference. That's why Paul says in meekness, we have to be gentle unto all men, and in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. The truth will offend them if they don't want the truth. It's the truth that offends them. We don't have to go out of our way to offend them. We just speak the truth and we do it in meekness. But you have some brethren out there that are losing it, and they're starting to attack other brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not correcting, they're attacking. This says, for if many, for in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able to bridle the whole body. Yeah. Verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. What is King David saying here? He's saying he wants the Lord to be that bit that's in his mouth. Give me the right words, O Lord, before my mouth. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Help me to say the right things, O Lord. Keep me from saying the wrong things. Verse 4. Behold also the ships, which though they be great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, wheresoever the governor governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Remember, a man, the imagination of man's heart is only evil con uh, continually. Out of, the imagination of the, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, that is set on the fire of hell. Brothers, says Christ, our words matter. Words have meaning, and how we, we talk to our brothers and sisters, how we talk to God matters. People seem to get that one. How we talk to God. You don't just come up to God treating Him like an equal. You don't put God down. That's God. Brothers, says Christ, how we talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ matters. How we talk and deal with the lost world matters. You can end, I was talking to a brother in Christ that says, there's times where, because of my pride, and I thought I was, when I was a young babe in Christ, I thought I was fighting for the word of God. How I came across turned people away from the truth. Because I didn't come across the way God says I'm supposed to come across. I came across as a jerk. No, we're supposed to be meek. We're supposed to be humble. We're just to preach the truth as it is. Take it or leave it. The other thing you can do is you can talk. If your talk doesn't line up with your walk, you lose your testimony. You can also destroy other brothers and sisters in Christ's testimony. Because if you're claiming to be one of me, well, it's like you're claiming to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, and you lose your testimony with people. When I come across and say I'm the same thing, I'm a King James Bible-believing God, I automatically lose my testimony with them because of you. And vice versa. Like I said, when I came across as a jerk, as a, as a babe in Christ, I probably hindered a lot of other brethren's you know, testimony when they tried to witness to these same people. How we talk is important, and King David knows it. That's why he asked God to direct his words. That's why today we say chapter and verse. Thy word have I hid in my heart. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and all things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of fine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. 
Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 15.10 says, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into a mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. How many times have you opened, I always call it, open mouth, insert foot. There's times I said things the wrong way. Okay. I got into arguments and fights with people where I got so frustrated that my flesh was taken over because it was going from just having a conversation, a Bible study, to a debating and to an argument, and your flesh starts to take over. And I said some things that were stupid. They don't line up with the Word of God. I started making a mess because my flesh started taking over. That's why we're not to debate the Word of God. That's why we don't get into arguments. You can get into a disagreement and keep it in a Bible study setting where you're talking and trying to reason with one another, but the moment it gets heated and it turns into an argument slash debate, you're done. Not because you're wrong, but what happens when your flesh starts getting riled up? Satan knows this. The enemy knows this. You start making mistakes. Okay. Luke 6.45 says, A good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth that forth which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. The truth will come out eventually. I remember some people will talk a talk, but they're not walking the walk. And when you back them into the corner with scripture, their, whole, their words change. Someone can put on a show, good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. When you stop being simple because you're seeking after God, and you study the Word of God, you can start going, hey, the Word of God says this. Hey, the Word of God says that. What you just said there is not in the Bible. The Word of God actually says this. And so on and so forth. Their attitude changes. Their words change. They go from trying to say the right things to start saying because their actions don't line up with what they say. Then their words will start lining up with their actions, especially defending sin, wickedness, worldliness. So be careful. There's times where people can talk the talk, but they're not walking the walk. That's why Paul said, prove your own selves. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. King David knew this. He didn't want hate to do the talking for him. He didn't want bitterness to do the talking for him. He didn't want pride, envy, and so on and so forth. He says, Lord, control my mouth. You know? He says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. Give me the right words, Lord. Give me the right words. I pray that all the time when I do Bible preaching or when I go out there to gospel tract or set out there when someone comes and tries to have a conversation with me about the Bible version issue, the true plan of salvation. I was like, Lord, give me the right words. Give me the right words. Set a watch. Set a watch before my... Set a watch, O oh Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. 2 Timothy 2.24 2 Timothy 2.24 I keep pointing this out. We're going to go through this verse a lot over and over in this study. Why? And it's going to be a long study. Forgive me, O Lord. Or, forgive, me, forgive, me, forgive me, brothers. Uh, this is an expository study, and... I'm trying to get what God puts on my heart. Okay? But 2 Timothy 2.24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive how you talk. Right from the get-go, how you talk will determine whether you're going to strive or not. Sometimes a good conversation where you're meek, you're humble, you're just preaching the truth, they can try to get you up into an argument. It can grow into striving. But when it first starts out, you can go immediately to striving based on your words. If you start off in attacking, name-calling, backbiting, whispering, being proud and, and, and prideful and putting yourself above them, and what I mean by that is I could be hitting someone else up with a problem that they have that I've done 50 times. But I've been saved 10 years. I did 50 times in the first you know, few years I got saved. I had the same problem too. So I come to him saying, hey, I know what you're going through. I had that same addiction. I had that same problem. But you need to give it up. Someone told me and, and, and stayed on top of me to help me get it up. I'm here as a brother in Christ to let you know you need to give it up. But if you come to him saying, I don't know if you're really saved. And, and you know, you're just this. And how could you even possibly do it? And you start attacking the person. 
you're going to start the striving just like that. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Some people seek fights. Some people seek to go to the striving. They're purposely trying to strive. Okay. I've seen that with some of the brethren. You just, you're out there looking for a fight. You think you're, you're looking for a fight like I'm fighting for the Lord, but no, you're just looking to fight to fight to please your flesh. All you do is stand for the truth. The fights might come your way, but we're not supposed to fight people like we're trying to force them to accept the truth. We just preach this truth. If they want to fight, let them fight. I'm just here to preach the truth. Why? Because it says here, A servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. We're not supposed to be fighting. How many times have you heard people say, I'm fighting for the Lord, I'm fighting. We're not supposed to be fighting. We're supposed to put on the whole armor of God, and we're supposed to be defending the Lord with the life that we live, and the words we speak when it comes to speaking truth. How we treat the brethren. How we treat the lost world. And our, remember it says, for, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where our fight is. Our fight isn't physical. But a lot of brethren love to get into physical fights. Verbal, physical fights. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. When you go to correct someone, it's a teaching matter. That's what you need to put on your heart. I think that would help a lot of the brethren here on, in ministry on YouTube and video platforms, some of the brethren in the Babel buildings. When you go to correct someone, you turn it into a teaching. Okay, this is what the Word of God has to say, and you're not lining up with it. You're teaching him the Word of God where he's in error and showing him the right way. But if all you're doing is pointing out his error and throwing it into his face, and then you kick him to the curb like he's nothing, that's not love for your brother. That's not love for anybody. It's not love for anybody, saved or lost. If you see a lost person heading for destruction, you want to teach them about the gospel. You want to teach them how to go to heaven when they die, so they don't go to hell. But some of these preachers out there are just preaching like they want people to go to hell. How they preach. They're turning people off to the true plan of salvation. A lot of them aren't even preaching the true plan of salvation. Apt to teach, patient, 25, verse 25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's why we correct people. We want to get, see them get back their heart right with God. Now, I know that you've ever talked people, have, have someone tell you, hey, you're so angry, you need, to you need to walk it off. You need to go for a walk. You need to cool down. You need to calm down. You ever heard that? That's a good thing. Why? Because if you talk out of anger, your, your, your flesh is going to take over, and you're not going to be able to control the words that come out. Okay. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. That's why they always teach for, for parents, yes, you don't spoil, spare the rod, you spoil the child. I don't believe in sparing the rod whatsoever. But here's the one thing. You never discipline out of anger. Do you want God disciplining you out of anger? He could. Remember, people think God doesn't get angry. No, the Bible says God is slow to anger. He just doesn't get angry on the spot. That's how we're supposed to be. You can be angry with the cause, but you're supposed to not to be quick to anger. I am. You're slow to anger. Now I'd say I'm not God. I, I, I fail a lot. There's times I get angry like that, and I need to calm down. I need to go for a walk. But you don't discipline your children out of anger. You do not correct somebody out of anger. I am. Moses is a good example. Meekest man outside of Jesus Christ, but I mean, before Jesus Christ, because Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, outside of God, he was the most meekest and humble man in the Bible. When someone tried to correct him and really, you know, tell him off and put him, you know, out of this place that God put him, he would humble himself and he would correct him. And when he talked to God later, he got to vent and lost his temper. God, respect now, not, not, not thou, their offering. But when he was dealing with the people face to face, he talked with them. He tried hard not to lose his temper. He was, he was meek. 
Right. Matthew 4.4 4, we read, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now we always think bread is like talking about food. We don't should live by bread food alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Sometimes I look at this and go, that bread there is talking about the words of the world. God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. Okay? God's way of doing things versus the flesh's way of doing things. We've got to sleep. We've got to eat. We do our best to stay warm. We do our best to cool ourselves down when it gets too hot. But we're not supposed to live by that way alone. It's the Word of God that's in our hearts, and that's supposed to be what drives us and how we live. And when someone doesn't line up with that, we correct them in meekness. And King David, he's saying, Lord, help me with my words. There's times, remember Paul, we'll use Paul. Remember Paul said, you're lucky I'm not there. I'm kind of, I'm paraphrasing, but when he's writing some of the Pauline epistles, mainly like Corinthians and Galatians, where these people are in wicked sin, Corinthians, he's like, you're lucky I'm not there. And be as I would, because right now he's hearing it, he's getting down, and he's writing as he's, you know, it's like, he's angry. And he's like, that you wouldn't see me as I am, and I wouldn't come and find you as you would. He's hoping that what he's heard is a lie. It's, it's, it's someone bearing false witness, you know. He's hoping that it isn't true, and he's really angry. And he says, when I come there to correct you face to face, i got to get rid of this anger, i got to calm down. You wouldn't like me like this. And he wouldn't like himself like that. Because he's the one that's telling us in meekness, instructing those that oppose. He wouldn't be meek. There's times we can lose our temper. And it's not good. Right? We have a teaching about, you know, uh, you can be angry with the cause, but the Bible says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. You need to give, at, at some point, even if you're angry with the cause, you need to give that anger to the Lord by the end of the day. And get back to being meek and humble and serving the Lord and praying to the Lord and doing what's right. But you don't need that anger is only going to turn into bitterness, and that bitterness is only going to turn into hate. God knows this. Even if you're angry with the cause, so you're angry with somebody, you're in the right, they're in the wrong. If you hold on to that anger, that anger is going to turn into bitterness towards that person. Next thing you know, you're going to be hating that person, especially with your actions. How are you supposed to lead that person to the truth like that? You can't. You can't lead to someone to the truth like that. God's going to have to send somebody else. You're broken. When you let your anger get the better of you and it turns into bitterness and it turns into hate, you're not broken. God's got to use somebody else. And He will. So King David's saying, hey, help me control what I say and how I say it. Okay. Psalms, 14, uh, Psalms 141, 4. Let's get back to Psalms 141, 4. He says, Incline not my ear to any evil thing. Okay. To practice wicked works with men, the works that work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. So basically, the temptation. There's no temptation taking you that such as common demand, but will with the temptation to provide a way to escape. He's talking about Hearing it. Okay, I'm throwing all, I need the verse like, abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Incline not my ear to, to, to any evil thing. He's talking about ear. Help me not get false uh, counseling. Someone coming along saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal. A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. It all depends on how you look at it. Who are you to judge me? You know, all these things where they come in with all these, all there's things that we can agree to disagree when it comes to the Word of God. That's false counsel. That's evil. Paul says we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. Paul, the Bible says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little bit don't hurt. The Bible says it does. And you go, you see what I'm saying? You're getting bad counsel. King David said, I don't want to get bad counsel. I don't want to practice the wicked works with men, with men that work iniquity. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in writing and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, the way the lost world does, not in strife and envying, 
But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Galatians 5.16 says, This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And what King David is saying is, is there's people going to come in, and they're going to tempt you. They're going to tempt him. They're going to entice him. That's where we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The verse that these easy believism, the Babel building people hate it. They misuse it. They add words there that aren't there. They add to it to try to corrupt it. Because they can't stand 2 Corinthians. I'm in first. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, plural. The thing that they like to add to this is they'll say, It's talking about marriage. Where is it talking about a wife or a husband or marriage? It's not. This, in context, is talking about the lost world versus the saved. Saved or not to be fellowshipping with the lost world. It's not saying I can't hold a conversation. I go for a walk. I walk by. There's a neighbor out in the yard doing work. We stop. I ask him how he's doing. He asks me how I'm doing. Sometimes I've given gospel tracts. I've been able to witness. I'm there to see how he's doing. Does he need any help with anything? That's not fellowship. Fellowship is hanging out with someone and doing the things that they do. I do not hang out with the lost world and do the things that they do. I'm talking about the wicked things. Okay? This says with unbelievers, plural. You're not allowed to have more than one wife and one husband. For the sisters in Christ, one husband. For the hut of the brethren, one wife. This is unbelievers, plural. It's talking about the world as a whole. You're not to fellowship with them. When you go to worship God, when you go to read the Word of God together, when you go to pray together, when you go to sing hymns, worship, sing hymns, when you go to listen to good, solid Bible teaching and preaching outside the Gospel, outside the Gospel, the lost world's not supposed to be there. You're not to invite the lost world in. That's what we're seeing about King David here. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? King David is sitting here saying, Incline my, not my heart to evil things, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity, ungodly men. And let me not eat of their dainties. Be tempted. Well, the number way you can stop from being tempted is you don't hang out and indulge. Well, I'll go to the bar with some of my friends. I just won't drink. What's going to happen? If you used to drink all the time with your friends, guess what's going to happen eventually? You'll get back into drinking. You don't go. You don't do it. Verse 15, And what, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. How you live and what you indulge in, what you do, reflects on Jesus Christ. If you're saved and born again, it reflects on Jesus Christ. You're now an ambassador for Jesus Christ. When you go out to the lost world, it's to witness to them. The lost world gets to see you, and you get to be a living witness, and you can go out and verbally witness. But you're not supposed to be indulging in the things and doing the things the lost world does when it comes to the ways of this world, the evil, the wickedness, the sin, the lust of the flesh. Verse 17 says, Wherefore come out from among them, plural, not him or her for, for a husband or wife, them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. What's going on here? King David saying, hey, I don't want to be around these people. Uh, help me to see through these people and know who are godly men and who are fakes and frauds, and the ones that are obvious, help me to stay away from them. Help me to stay away from them. King David was a, was a soldier for Jesus Christ, and I'm just letting you know that I was in the military, and you want to talk about 
If I wasn't saved then, I wish I was. But I wasn't saved then. But if I was saved when I was in the military, it had been hard. They loved to drink. They loved to swear. They loved telling jokes. They loved their fornication. And it's all around you. I'd have gotten to the point where I couldn't probably hang out with anybody that was in uniform outside of work. Outside my regular duties. And that's what it's getting in these last days. Get, people, Brothers and Christ, it's fighting because you, you get lonely and you let the flesh talk you out of and talk you into compromising because you feel lonely. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Get back into Bible studies and Bible reading. God will bring men in your life to fellowship with. I've been fellowshipping a lot, doing Bible studies, and talking about, you know, what's going on in the world. We talk about our struggles with the flesh. But incline, back to Psalms 4, 141. 4, it says, Incline not my ear to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity and let me not eat of their dainties. How do you do that? You don't fellowship with the lost world. You don't hang out with the lost world in their evil deeds. In their evil deeds. You don't fellowship with them. And today, the Babel building system, the organized religion, Babel, they invite a lot of lost people, come on in. And the next thing you know, they start compromising and they start doing a lot of worldly things to please the lost world, to get them in and, and get those seats filled. They're not doing things God's way. And we've got studies on this. I've had other brethren who does studies on it where the Babel building system is predominantly, I haven't come across one Babel building system that does things God's way. Not one. They all compromise and they do things, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. And that traditions of men and rudiments of the world actually go against the word of God. They're not doing things God's way. You invite the lost world in. I've said this before, I'll do it like this. You're saved, they're lost. You invite them in thinking, hey, I'm way up here. Because you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be holy. Lift up holy hands. Be ye holy, for I am holy. They're wicked, lost sinners. You're a saved sinner, and God's cleaned up your life. You're holy. And you're like, well, I can get this guy to come up here. That's in your heart. That, that's the deception. You think, well, I, mean, I can get him to come up here. If we hang out together, I can see, you know, purposely try to force Christ on him and the truth on him, and, and I can get him to come up here. But you know what always happens? They get you to come down here. Every time. Someone who wants the truth, all you have to do is preach the truth to them. And they get saved, they get born again, you take them under your wing, as, it's, as they say. You know, Jesus talked about Israel, like a mother with a hen, and her chicks under her wing. You take them under your wing, and you start teaching them the word of God, so God starts cleaning them up and gets them back up to where you are. That's for someone who's newly saved, or you come across someone who's saved, and you can bring them up here. But if they're flat out lost, rejecting Jesus Christ, and don't want the truth, and you invite them in... They're always going to bring you down here, every time. King David knows this. As great a man as he is, he knows this. That's why he prays that prayer. Let me not start hanging out with these guys, because I'll become just like them. These evil, wicked men. Psalms 141.5 Let the righteous smite me. Smite you? It shall be a kindness. He's talking about correction taking correction. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me. There it is, there's the proof. It's talking about correction. Let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. Ephesians 5, verse 21. Ephesians 5, 21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. King David, the man after God's own heart, what he say? If I, what he's saying is, is if my life doesn't line up with God, if I'm not pleasing God first, if I'm doing something that's contrary to what God says, smite me, reprove me. I want to be on the right path. I want to be doing what's right in God's eyes. Ephesians 5:21 he says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. First Peter 5:5. 5, 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. That's the difference. Prideful people don't want correction. They love giving it. We know some pride people on, online. They love giving correction, but they don't love taking it. But it always comes back to being humble. True humility. 
For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. What gets in the way of taking correction? Getting prideful. Prideful and arrogant. Doing what's right in your own eyes. 1 Corinthians 1.10 But the Bible, even for today, it's not just in King David's day, it's in our day too. And I'm talking about taking correction. In his day, if you remember what happened to him between Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba, um, Nathan the prophet, God used Nathan the prophet to go preach. He'd use prophets to call men's sin out. And he had a chance to repent. Fall on your knees and repent. Or get prideful. And all through First and Second Kings, there's times where I'm like, for that king, I said, I just want to like smack the king upside the head and said, why won't you fall on your knees in repentance? Having sorrow for what you're getting corrected on. But some of them get prideful. Some of them put up like this, this wall. They won't come to God in repentance. King David did. And King David wanted that kind of correction. And when it happened, because he wanted it, he took it, he learned from it, and he repented. Turned from that wickedness and never made that mistake again. 1 Corinthians 1.10 Now I beseech you, brethren, that the name, by the name of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same things. Same thing. No, no, there's things we can agree to disagree. No, it says same thing. Brothers and Christ, anytime you have this false teaching of we can agree to disagree, you're always going to have division. When it comes to the Word of God, there's nothing we can agree to disagree on when it comes to the Word of God. Worldly issues that aren't sinful, like who's what's, like we can get into a discussion where my favorite color is green. I think green's the greatest color ever. Well, no, I, I disagree because I believe... Okay, that's a preference thing. I prefer green. It's a preference thing. When it comes to thus saith the Lord, there's no such thing as preference. I prefer, I feel, my opinion is, no, what's absolute truth? And we all need to be on the same page. We need to all be under that absolute truth. Speak the same things and that, you, and that there be no division among you. Why is there division among us? Because we're not speaking the same thing. But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment, submitting ourselves one to another when we don't line up with this book. Rightly dividing, of course. James 5, 5 16, for instruction in righteousness. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. The fastest, quickest way to get something solved is you confess your faults one to another. And I've done that publicly. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it publicly for everyone, but for the brethren, through online ministry, uh, through uh, videos, I've done it to brethren that I fellowship with and let them know, here's my addictions, here's my struggles with the flesh, here's my faults. I don't confess my individual sins in great details, I just confess my faults. Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. I was addicted to porn a lot before I got saved, so don't tell me that it never just disappears 100%. I go out and have to deal with the lost world, and you see a modestly dressed woman, and the flesh goes, oh yeah, and tries to bring bad thoughts back in, and I have to push them out with scripture, I have to push them out with singing a hymn. It's a struggle. I have faults. And God works through those faults, but you're to confess your fault. Now, this is instruction righteous. It's a good thing. That's the first step to helping you keep you you know, uh, accountable. When it says submit yourself one to another, that's the best way to get your, get ahead of the game, as they say, when it comes to accountability. Here's my problems. Here's my faults. I know a brother in Christ that used to say that pride, he used to have a struggle with pride. Doesn't much say it anymore. Why? Because the man's gotten so prideful and so ego-driven. He just said it to say it. He wasn't really confessing his fault and being accountable to anybody. you got to confess it, to a brother says Christ and be accountable. I always ask the brethren, and when a brother tells me they have a struggle with this, every so often I'll hit them up and say, how is your walk with the Lord when it comes to this issue? How's it going? I mean, King David's talking about, hey, we're supposed to be accountable. We're not supposed to be above correction. 2 Timothy 2, 24, we'll get back to it. When you confess your fault one to another, when you are accountable one to another, and that correction comes in, that reproof, 
that correction, you're supposed to do it. 2 Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them the repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captain by him as well. You take the correction. How you correct somebody is important. How you do it. It'll determine, uh, first off, it'll get, how you start off will give you the greatest success when it comes to correcting somebody. If you start off being a jerk, attacking the person, they, their shield comes up. And you'll lose almost every time. But if you're humble and in meekness, when you're trying to be accountable to one another, and you, want, and you have somebody that wants accountability, I want the righteous to smite me. If I'm doing something that isn't right according to this book, and I'm not doing things the right way, I want to be smited by righteousness. I want to be hit with the truth. I want to be, as I say, smacked upside the head with the truth, saying, hey, get back on the right path. But when you get people who don't want the truth, but King David's saying, I do want it. He's saying, I want it. Let the righteous smite me. Back to uh, Psalms 141.5. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be kindness, and let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, with, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. How they come across. His prayer shall be in their... He's going to pray for it, because he wants it. So if someone comes after him to attack him... I've had people attack me and still come across as a jerk... And in the moment I put up a shield, but later on, because I love the truth and I want the truth, I'll be like, you know what? They, they didn't have to act the way they did. And I talked with the Lord and said, but you know what? They got a point. Yeah, I, I didn't say the right passage. I just don't like, I, I don't like when false converts or the, you know, the lost world, they look for your mistakes that you make and they pounce on your mistakes and use that as justification not to listen to anything you say. Now, when they pounce on my mistakes, I don't like it when they do that. Why? Because they're using that as justification not to listen to anything else I say. At the same time, though, I look at that and go, I still did make that mistake, and I need to correct it so they can't use it as an excuse next time. We still take correction. Okay. The feet are... Uh, reprove. When he says, and there shall be kindness, and let him reprove me. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. How we're supposed to reprove people? For correction, for instruction and in righteousness. This is the final authority. When you go to correct someone, you do it this way. You can come across as being right. You can be right according to this, but when it's all your words, that's not the right way to correct somebody. Lying's wrong because you know it hurts people, and, and we, we, all, we don't like it when people lie to us. What happened to thus saith the Lord? This is still how we're supposed to correct people. Okay? That's why we just show, we reprove the world of sin. We show them that they're sinners and that they've sinned against God and that they need to get saved. But for brothers and sisters in Christ, we try to correct them and get them back on the right path. Because they are saved. Those who are lost, we let them know how much of a sinner they are and that they're on their way to hell. And they deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. Look at this you're doing. Look at that you're doing. That's sin. That's wickedness. Of course, that attitude is not popular today. But all scripture, why? Why is it important that reproof is part of it? Verse 17 says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. With King David, he's a man after God's own heart. He wants to be a man of God, that the man of God, he wants to be a man of God, and he does want to have a perfect heart. And he wants his works to line up with God's word, God's way of doing things. We have that today. We have it today. 2 Timothy 4, 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. There's a coming judgment. Why do we correct people? There's a coming judgment. Lost people, we try to lead them to Christ through correction by showing them that they're sinners on their way to hell. We don't try to get them to change on the spot. We're just trying to show them their sin and wickedness. Why? Because there's a coming judgment. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we correct one another. Why? Because there's still a coming judgment for us. The judgment seat of Christ. At, and who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, the judgment seat of Christ, and his kingdom. 
When he starts his thousand year reign, at the end of his thousand year reign, there's the great white throne judgment. But when he starts his, uh, his reign at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, it's called the judgment of the nations. There, everyone's still being judged. People think, I got saved, I'm free from any judgment. You are deluded and you've been lied to. Two, because of this judgment that's coming, verse 2, we preach the word to both lost and saved. Lost is the gospel and, the, and sin and hell. To the saved, we preach how to live a life of Christ, how to get your life clean, how to be on the same page, how to be standing for what's right, how to be living for what's right. Two, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. There's the reproof. The correction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but if their own lusts, the flesh gets involved. We all struggle with the flesh, brother, says Christ. There's times where the flesh gets the better, gets better, or gets the better of us sometimes. It's still our fault. We let it. We're not supposed to make provisions for the flesh. We're not supposed to go out of our way to put temptation in front of us. But there's times we fail the Lord. And we get that correction and it gets us back on the right path. But you have people, because people, today that's not popular. You're not supposed to reprove. You're not supposed, you, you, you can correct, but you shouldn't want to take correction. You should have the attitude, I don't want correction. I just love to give it. I don't like to take it. That's not how King David was. That's not how we're supposed to be. But after their own, this is what happens when you start taking away correction, confessing your faults one to another, being sub, and submission, submitting one to another, being accountable one to another. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. We're going to get to this. Watch in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy mystery. We're supposed to watch all things in all things. We see a brother in Christ failing, we go to correct him. We see him stumble and fall, we go to help pick him back up. All things. We see lost people we like to get saved, we try to witness to him, preach the truth to him to see him get saved. But there's reproof. King David's like, reprove me. I want it. If I'm wrong, I want proof. Reproof. Now, brothers and Christ, be careful of those people who say, well, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong. I've had a lot of conversations with people who came to me to correct me, saying I'm wrong, and we sat there and did a Bible study, and they walked away saying that the Bible's right, and they were wrong. There's times where I had to sit here and take the correction because the Bible's right, and I'm wrong. It's not about me being right or him being right. It's about us being lined up with the book. We're of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. We're all on the same page. Someone came to correct me. I said, okay, let's, let's do a Bible study and see where I'm wrong. And there's times where I showed them where they were wrong. There's times where I had to admit I'm wrong. But it's that attitude that someone comes and tries to correct me. I've talked to post-trib, mid-trib. I've talked to Trinitarians. I've talked to the false gospel people, the easy believism gospel people. Some people say, well, I already know the truth. I don't need to talk to them. How are you supposed to witness to anybody if you don't talk to them? The whole point of witnessing is you talk to them. You can be a living witness and you can be a verbal witness. Okay? But we're supposed to watch in all things. We're supposed to endure affliction. So I'll be honest with you, there's sometimes those conversations don't go well. <laughs> I'm not saying every conversation I have where someone's trying to correct me or I'm trying to correct them goes perfectly. No, sometimes it can go south real quick. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist, no matter what. Make full proof of thy ministry. Proverbs 36 said, Add thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Like I said, the number one way that would help the brothers and sisters of Christ become, uh, you know, stop the division and help us unite under this book is we get back to thus saith the Lord, chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. It won't solve every problem, but it will solve a good number of the false doctrines and false teachings that are out there. Because a lot of them are based off of words and phrases and titles and terminology that's not found in the scriptures. And if they just say it the Bible way, the Bible, saying it the Bible way, disproves the false teaching way. 
Because the only way the false teaching way has merit is they have to start, they have to start saying things the Bible doesn't actually say. Like faith alone. Chapter and verse where it says faith alone. Today we're justified by faith. The just shall live by faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's not faith alone. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And that gift is salvation, eternal life. That gift is a free gift. But the Bible says repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith has never been alone. You say faith alone. Chapter and verse. We don't care. They don't care. But you tried. A lot of people today just add to God's word. And they got to get reproved and found a liar. They're a liar. Faith alone. They're a liar. Free grace. Chapter and verse where it says free grace. In fact, God's grace cost. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. That grace still came at a cost. It's not free. It came at a cost. I just didn't have to pay that cost. And the whole thing about free grace is they're trying to make it out to be 100% free, like there was no cost. And we don't have to come in repentance. We don't have to come sorry. Whole other, whole other issue. But you hit them up with all these things like Trinity, God in three persons, uh, Church Age, um, Rapture. I'm trying to go with things. Second Advent, Triune God. Um, you know, God in three persons. God is three persons. And you go through all these sayings that they just come up with, millenn uh, the millennial kingdom, and so on and so Where's this stuff at in the Bible? So we correct them and reprove them. That's how you can tell whether someone's a Bible believer. or There's two things. I'm trying to be graceful. That's how you can tell when someone's a fake and a fraud. But if you knew someone who once stood for the Bible as it is, and then now they're starting to get over into worldly terms and traditions of men. They've been spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They might have started out on the right path and they've fallen away, or they were never on the right path to begin with. That's where spiritual discernment comes in. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they have gone. Okay, he was saved, but now he's still saved. Not was, but he is saved. But he's fallen away. He's losing his way. And that's where you go in and try to correct them and get them back on the right path. When you realize you're dealing with a false convert, you just go to the gospel. Get saved before it's too late. I remember back in the day, people used to get upset because they'd get into a good argument with me when I realized I was dealing with someone who wasn't a Bible believer. They weren't truly saved and born again. All I did was link the gospel to a message to them and said, time's running out. Oh, no, no, I want to fight about the Godhead. I don't argue with lost people over the Word of God. I don't argue with people that aren't King James Bible believers. I don't. Here's the gospel. Get saved. Get a King James Bible. Believe in it. Then come talk to me. When we both have the same final authority, then we can talk. Then we can talk. But you get reproved when you add to the Word of God. What's causing a lot of the division? People adding to the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.24 and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach patience and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Who likes to add to God's word? Satan does. You have your father devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning, and the father of it. Who cover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. I always err on the side of caution in the sense, I always have grace, and I err on the side of caution. The grace part is this, they could just been taught wrong, get caught up in traditions of men. You know, let's see if they've never really studied the issue. Some people just parrot what they've heard some guys say behind the camera, and they don't look into it themselves. I've done that. I've done that. So you kind of have some grace. But you always err on the side of caution in the sense that, we have to go back to the Bible. We can't just have a conversation of my feel, getting caught up into my feelings and opinions. I'm always going to err on the side of caution in the sense that we always need to come back to the, what the Bible actually says. So when someone says something, there's times someone said something that I didn't remember or I didn't know, and I said chapter and verse, and they showed it to me chapter and verse. It was there. Okay? But I still err on the side of caution. Even if I think I'm in the right, when I find out I'm in the wrong, it's always a good idea to say chapter and verse. Okay. And when you correct someone, remember to have meekness. Turn it into a teaching. And be gentle. Turn it into a teaching uh, chance to teach. 
and instruct, and, do, and you have to be gentle. So let's go back to Psalms 141. So you have that, that King David is talking about set a, um, reproving him. He's saying he wants to be corrected. He does. Okay, why? Even those who are trying to correct him to use that, his fault to destroy him, he'll still take it. Why? Because he gets his heart right with the Lord, and the person who sought to destroy him, you say, well, what are you getting that from? Remember what it said here. Let the righteous smite me. Psalms 141.5. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. When he repents and gets his heart right with the Lord, they're going to be like those who are seeking your destruction. They realize you're not being destroyed. You're being built back up. There's those who seek you to be built up. There's those that seek your destruction. But if you're wrong, what's important is I need to have my heart right with God. King David said, I want to be right with God no matter what. No matter what, I want to be right with God. Like I said, I've had lost people correct me. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's tough, especially when I'm 100% wrong. Okay. It's tough. You can lose your testimony with people when you do the wrong thing and they call you out for it. Okay. Psalms 141.6 When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Now we talked about he's, King David's attitude towards taking correction. Let the righteous smite me. He wants to be reproved. When he's wrong and he doesn't line up with the, God's word, God's way, he wants to get back in the right path. Now he's, he's going over to talk about how he corrects people. Taking reproof. This is King David giving it out before it was King David taking, taking it. He was taking correction. Now he's giving it out. Their judges are overthrown in stony places. They shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Some people can say, well, this is more like him just saying, when they call him out, their calamity is their judges will come to judge him, but his words, because they want to hear him deny it. They want to hear him deny what he did. They want to hear him try to defend the truth. They want an argument. They want to fight. They want to seek people's destruction. But you know what really puts a stop to things? When you just sat there and King David's like, yep, that was me. Yep, that was me. I did that. I shouldn't have done it. I was wrong. I've turned from that wickedness. I've repented. I've gotten my heart right with the Lord. I've had people attack me and keep holding past mistakes against me. They have. I said, but I've repented on that. I got my heart right with the Lord. I'm trying my best not to make that mistake again. But they'll hold it over you like a noose. But King David here says, They shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Why? Because uh, Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, Proverbs 3.11, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Correction's a good thing, no matter who it's coming from. It not, might not feel so good coming from certain people trying to seek to destroy King David, trying to seek to destroy me, trying to seek to destroy you, brother, says Christ, when you make a mistake. But you need to learn how to take correction, period. This is right. I'm wrong. I need to line up with this book. I need to get right so I line up with this book, regardless of who's correcting me. If this is right and they're wrong, you're wrong, whoever's watched this wrong, you need to line up with this book. 2 Peter 1.19 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Holy men, holy men of God. Men have gotten their life right with God. Okay. That goes back to that, we aren't going to get into those scriptures where it talks about hypocritical judgment. I get on to you for doing something that I'm doing. I know it's wrong, and I'm telling you what you're doing is wrong, yet I'm doing the same thing. Now, I always try to say there's times where I can get it, like, I, I struggle with those things in, the, in my head, 
and everything, the temptations for Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. I remember listening to satanic style music. There's times I'll hear it at this grocery store or something, and I'll start humming along or singing along, and I have to stop and start singing something else, like a hymn. I still struggle with some of these sins, but the hypocrisy comes in where I justify me doing it, but how dare you do it? That's when hypocrisy comes in. This says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Who corrected King David? Nathan did. Today, the brethren, we have the Holy Ghost in us, and we can correct one another through the, through the Spirit by the Word of God. So every once in a while, you talk, the Bible says that the laws of God are written on every man's heart. That the, the laws of God are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to let us know that we've sinned against God, we've failed to do things God's way 100%. To do everything right 100%. So you can still have a lost person that has the laws of God written on their heart. Or they use talking points where they've heard somebody else who's saved call you out for something and they'll do the same thing because they want to try to find fault in you. Mm -hmm. But correction's correction. And it's the Holy Ghost in you that bears witness with the Holy Spirit in someone else. When someone's come to correct me, it's hard, especially if they come across as a jerk. But the Holy Spirit in me gets into me and says, listen, he, I know, you got to get through the jerk part. you got to get through the, you know, the bad attitude. Is what he's saying right? And there's been times that they still were right. How we take correction is important. And King David is like, I'll take it. Even if it's from people trying to destroy me, I'll take it. 1 Timothy 5.20 says, Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. Maybe King David is saying, I believe he is, that them correcting me, it'll keep somebody else from making the same mistake. The reason we, this isn't saying that you purposely go out of your way to make sure you have a crowd. It's saying when someone sins, you rebuke them on the spot. You put a stop to that sin ASAP, as soon as possible ASAP. Okay? You don't let it fester, a little leaven leaven the whole lump. If it's just you and that brother in Christ, then you still correct him. You don't wait for an audience. You correct him on the spot. Now, if there's people around, you don't say, well, I need to wait. No, you still correct him on the spot. But then the sin rebuke before all. That others may fear. We learn from each other's mistakes. And there's still supposed to be the fear of God. It seems in these last days, everything can be done like privately and, and everything... And where's the fear of God? Because it's private. It's not supposed to remain private. We're supposed to get it out there. You're doing wrong. We give you. I always give a brother or sister Christ a chance to correct on this. Like, I'll go to him and try to correct him. I, we don't have a house church, so there's not like where I can walk to their home. There's lots of people, and I'll correct them to their face regardless who's around. It's always online. It's usually always one-on-one -on -one to begin with. And then if they won't repent... I'll do a Bible study to try, without naming him, I'll do a Bible study trying to encourage them and to exhort them to do what's right. And if it's bad enough that they're pulling people away, then I'll call them out. And I have called out some people. I just don't go out of my way to put on a show and make so much division and, and drama where you're just calling people's names out without actually going to the person and talking to them. This says, them that sin, rebuke before all. You're supposed to go to them and rebuke them. Regardless who's around, you're rebuking them before all. Doesn't matter who's around. But you're still supposed to go to that person and try to get them back on the right page to get to build them back up. 2 Timothy 2.23 again. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Them that sin, rebuke before all. How do we do it? I have to teach patience. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We do it in meekness, not with pride. But some people can become prideful. And they expect people like King David, they expect you to just, when they come prideful, they're trying to look for that contention and see you explode and get into big fights and arguments. But if you're wrong, you say, yep, I was wrong with that. Yep, I was wrong. But that doesn't mean I'm wrong over here. Nice try. Doesn't mean I was wrong over there. Nice try. But what you're bringing up, yeah, I was wrong. They're looking for a fight and an argument. They want to see that pride puffed up in you. King David's like, no, no. They shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Humbling yourself and confessing your sin where you're wrong, not lining up with this book, is a good thing. And then getting lined up with this book. 
It needs to happen too. Just saying I'm wrong and not doing anything about it is not a good thing either. When you say you're wrong, you need to do something about it, if it's possible. Sometimes you've got to give it to God and, and continue to You made a mistake, and you get back to do what's right, you give that mistake to God. Okay? That meekness. King David was not above correction. He was a judge in Israel. He was a warrior. He gave commands. He was a leader. A captain of the host of the captain. Not the host of heaven, but captain. He called... Remember at the very beginning? Uh, a man after my own heart, the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. He was captain over his people, but he was also a captain like over a group of people when he was on the run from Saul. He was given, you know, commands. He was the leader. But King David was not above correction. Taking it, not just giving it. People will act like, well, I'm not above correction. I know how to give it. Well, being above correction means you don't know how to take it. King David could take it. Can you take it, brothers and sisters of Christ? My door has always been open. You, you have a disagreement with something I teach or preach? Come talk to me. I've always had the policy that the first and second admonition reject. I give you first and second admonition. I'll give you two chances. We, I sit and talk with people for a couple hours every session. So four hours worth, but like two sessions of two hours apiece with people who disagree with me. I'll give you a chance. We'll go through the scriptures and find out where the Bible's right and I'm wrong. But I guarantee you the Bible's always right. As long as you're using it lawfully. You're not adding to it or subtracting from it. You're rightly dividing it. So King David, he's not above correction. Taking it or giving it. No matter what the condition is, because people try to make up conditions. Well, they're a jerk, or well, they, you know, they just want to seek my destruction. Are they right? You're supposed to better yourself for the Lord and make sure you line up with this book. And God will use whoever He wants to use. Don't you remember in the Old Testament, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant? Nebuchadnezzar was a heathen man that wanted to be worshipped as God, and he was worshipped as a lowercase g God. That man is burning in hell right now, but God still used him. I forgot, uh, do you guys remember the prophet, the, I forgot whose name was, but he was, um, they tried to use him, these other kings came together and tried to use him to curse Israel, and God used him, and later on down the road in the Bible, you read about it, he was an evil, wicked man, but at the time God used him, the Holy Ghost came upon him, and he blessed Israel, God still used him, and he was a lost, heathen man, okay, God can use anybody to get his people back around. He, he let lo the lost world come in and attack the Israel, the Jewish people when they sinned against him. God will use any, anyone for his glory. We need to take correction no matter what. We need to get back in the attitude that I want to be right. I want to be lined up with this book. And if I'm saying something wrong or if I'm doing something wrong, I need to get it fixed regardless who it's coming from. Psalms 141.7. Well, what's the big deal? What's the hurry? Psalms 141.7. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth, as when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. Genesis 6.3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. After the flood, life went from them living to be 900-something years down to 120 years. Then you get to King David's day, Psalms 91.10. The days of our years are three score years and ten, 70. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, 80. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Life expects he got down to 80 years. Okay? Ecclesiastes 2.17 says, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirits. Now, if you read, listen to Ecclesiastes, which I did today, what he's talking about is the actual work itself, but he starts talking about seeking wisdom, seeking God's way. That's not vanity. But just thinking that this life, this is it, you know, there's no coming judgment. I don't have to answer to any God. 
and, and you know, there's, after I die, I become nothing, then this life is just vanity. Without the Lord God Almighty, our Creator of heaven and earth, without eternity, whether you're going to spend it in heaven or hell, all is vanity down here. All is vanity. What's the point? King David gets to the point where he's saying, Hey, someday bones are scattered in the graveyard's mouth, and when all and one cutteth and cleaveth upon wood the earth. There's our day-to-day -day stuff that you might have to get done, but what's important is that my heart's right with the Lord. That I'm living right. That I'm taking correction. All is vanity if you're not looking at eternity. There's nothing down here that's worth getting in the way of you taking correction, taking correction and giving it. And life is short. Life is short. Compared to eternity, life is short. 80 years down here versus uh, eternity, millions and millions of years. I'm just trying to throw a number so we can kind of act like it, but eternity is eternity. Simple 80 years down here. I need to take the correction and get my heart right with God now. No matter where that correction is coming from. Romans 14, 7 says, For none of us liveth unto himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. That's how we are today. That's why it's not vain. Me living a life of Christ and serving Him and praising Him and pleasing Him and doing things His way, it's not vanity. Because I am saved. I was without God and without hope in the world. That blessed hope. Knowing what about eternity and what's after death, where I'm going to go for eternity, now I do. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that we might that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Here it is, verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. There's always a judgment for everyone. Saved and lost. That's why taking correction is so important. And without that eternity, life is vanity. Life is worthless. And King David's like, life is fleeting. This life can come and go. The day-to-day -day task. How many times have you heard people say, wow, that year went by fast? Or I look back, I was, ta I was, thinking, I was talking to the Lord and thinking, you know, 40, 45 years old. And I started thinking back to when I was 18, just getting out of high school. 23 years? 22 years. 22 years. No, 27 years. <laughs> 27 years. So my math isn't always great. Time goes by fast. In the moment, it might feel like it's going by so slow sometimes. But every time you look back, you're like, wow, I don't have much time. i got to get busy for the Lord, living for Him and doing what's right. Get back. I need to get busy praying every day. I need to get busy staying in this Word every day. I need to get busy making sure I'm lined up with this Word. And when someone comes along to correct me, if the, when they show me the Word of God, and the Word of God's right, and I'm wrong, I need to submit to this book. As it is. Ephesians 6.18. Remember Ephesians chapter 6, where it's talking about putting on the whole armor of God. After you put on the whole armor of God, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. We're supposed to be watching out one for another. Not just for the enemy, I'm going to stand by, by you to defend you against the enemy. It's talking about you watch out for one another when you see a brother and sister Christ stumble and fall. They get into sin and wickedness and worldliness. They start changing this to hide their sin and wickedness or to justify their sin and wickedness and worldliness. We're supposed to watch the brethren. You're starting to stumble. You're starting to fall. Let me help you get back up. Let me help you get back on the right path. Life is short. Psalms 141.8. Here it is. It's talking about life. You know, the grave. Psalms 141.8. But mine eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord. Someone who's saved and born again, we know where we're going when we die. We know where we're going when we're dying. 
Death doesn't scare us. Death doesn't confuse us. Like, what's going to happen to us after we die? We're not scared of death. If anything, you have fear that you didn't do as much for the Lord in life as you wanted to, or should have done. But you're not fearing death. But my eyes are upon thee, O God, the Lord, and thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. King David is the one that said, Leave not my soul in hell, because he knew, Holy Spirit in him, he knew that Abraham's bosom was in hell. It wasn't called Abraham's bosom in the Old Testament, but there was two parts to hell. Where the Old Testament saints went, and where the lost people went in the Old Testament. You had the fiery sides of hell, and then you had uh, the upper, the lower hells is the fiery side of hell. Then you have the upper hells, because you've got the rich man Lazarus, and the rich man looks up to see Lazarus. And you have a spot up in hell where it's just Abraham's bosom. But he's talking about his soul, he's talking about eternity. What matters is eternity, not things that are temporal. We've talked, Paul talks about this. When he says that uh, you're supposed to mind not earthly things, but you're supposed to keep your eyes on eternal things. Not temporal, but eternal. Not the physical, but the spiritual. How are you going to get to spend eternity? We're supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, that blessed hope. The judgment seat of Christ. We're not supposed to get distracted with things down here that are temporal. There's nothing down here that's worth you getting in the way of your walk with the Lord and getting you to mess with this book. There's nothing down here that's worth getting in the way of your walk when it comes to your fellowship with the brethren. I've had brethren break fellowship so they can have worldly and earthly things. I've had brethren set bad examples and ruin their testimony and their ability to lead people to Christ because they want things of the world. There's nothing down here that's worth it. It says, leave not my soul destitute. Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust in the Lord with all my, thine heart, that my eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord, and thee is my trust. Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Once again, my life is about pleasing my Creator, God Almighty. Pleasing my Savior who gave his life for me. Doing things God's way. I know that there's a judgment and I'm going to be judged by it. This life is, is short. Sometime this life will be over. If I'm blessed with, the, with being alive at the catching away, I'll get caught up and we have the judgment seat of Christ. But if I die before that catching away, I still have that judgment seat of Christ. That's going to happen someday. And once I die or get caught up at that moment, it's too late. There is no going back saying, well, I'm going to run back real quick and do this real quick or do that real quick. I'll go back and start. It's too late. Get busy living for the Lord now. Get busy taking the correction now if it needs to be and make sure you're living a life of Christ. You're praying without ceasing. You're staying in the Word of God in prayer. You've, you're sanctifying yourself. You're a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. Remember, the definition of being in Christ Jesus has made unto us wisdom the beginning of wisdom is fearing God. The end of wisdom is loving God. You fear God. You seek His way. You start seeking Him, His word, His way, what pleases Him. And the end, you keep His commandments. But the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If a man love me, he'll keep my words. So what's the end of wisdom? Loving God. True love for God is keeping His word. You fear God. You seek what pleases Him and what His way is, and you do it. Then it talks about a uh, made unto us righteousness, being ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Made unto us sanctification, getting sin and wickedness out of our life, getting worldliness out of our life. And then made unto us redemption, reminding us that we're supposed to be the motivators looking for that blessed hope. That we're going to go home and we're going to have to answer to God someday for our life as a Christian. Psalms 141.9 says, back to Psalms 141.9, Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me, the temptations, and the gins of the workers of iniquity. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Remember, we're not supposed to make provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We're not. 
We're not supposed to be fulfilling the lust thereof. Okay? That, that, when you read about temptations, when the temptation gets too out of control, it's not that the Word of God isn't right. God's talking about the average temptation that just happens to come your way because you're doing your basic stuff. I've got to go to the grocery store. i got to get my shopping, grocery shopping done. Or if I run to the hardware store because I need this part, and they're starting to play something that's tempting, like the satanic style music, or you see an immodestly dressed man or woman um, for the sisters in Christ versus the brothers in Christ, and there's this temptation. You look the other way, God will give you the strength to overcome that temptation. You get what you need and you get out. But why do people fall for temptation a lot? Because they're purposely putting it in front of them. They're making provisions for the flesh. The lost world puts, is trying to put snares in front of your, in front of you to try to get you to tempt it, to get you to struggle, to stumble and fall. Why would you do it yourself? Can you imagine sitting there? It's like someone laid these traps outside my house, and there's 50 traps out there, and you're like, and the one guy looks at you and goes. Well, how many of them are yours? Eh, about 40 of them. The man, the, the Lord, you know, the lost world only came by and laid 10 traps, but the other 40 traps I put out there. Why? By making provisions for the flesh, putting wickedness in front of me, compromising. There's no temptation as long as it's the world and God allowing the world to let some temptations in to keep us strong to, to the Lord. But when you start purposely tempting, tempting yourself by making provisions for the flesh, it's not the same thing. Now you're failing the Lord. You're purposely wanting to fail the Lord. And you want to blame it on temptation. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Psalms 101.3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. What did King David say? He said, Keep them... From the, keep me from the snares which they have laid for me. They're trying to seek his destruction. They're trying to get him to stumble and fall. And the gins of the workers of iniquity. Psalms 143.10, he says, Let the wicked fall in their own nets. See, they're trying to cast a net for me. Let them fall in their own nets. Whilst that I withal escape. Remember we just read up there, there's no temptation taking but it's common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. We just read here, Psalms 143.10, Let the wicked fall into their own nets, whilst that I withal escape. God will always provide a way to escape. Titus 3.8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Notice it says avoid. Verse 10, A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, you try to reach him the first time. You go back a second time. You might even bring a brother in Christ with you to be a second witness. Okay. But when they don't want the truth, you avoid them, knowing that, the, that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. And once again, I keep saying that. Man's, yelling at the camera is not the same thing. When it says a man that is an heretic after the first or second admonition, yelling about him at the camera doesn't count as an admonition. Any coward can yell at the camera. True love and courage is going to that person and talking to that person and giving that person an admonition, first and second admonition, which I do all the time. My door is open. You disagree with me, come talk to me. There's times I've tried to reach other people. But it says avoid. Knowing that he that is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself, let the wicked fall in their own nets. Whilst that I with all escape. They don't want the truth? That's what today it's just we've gotten so lazy, brothers of Christ, that they, we automatically assume they don't want the truth, so we don't even give it to them. No, you need to try to give them the truth, and then when they don't want the truth, okay, I'm done. If you see a brother in Christ that you've called a brother in Christ, saying, I love you, brother, I'm here for you, brother, I'm praying for you, brother, and you see them go in the wrong direction, and you don't even take time to, out to go talk to them with the, and do a, you know, talk to them with the Word of God to get them back on the right path, 
Either A, you never loved him to begin with, you're a liar, or you've gotten very lazy and cowardly that you won't go talk to your brother in Christ to get him back on the right path. But once again, what talks about once you've tried and they don't want anything to do with the truth, you're done with them. That's your escape. You're done. If you stay, uh, 1 Corinthians 5.11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater, he's talking about in the moment, present tense, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. You've tried correcting him in their sin, and they're going to continue in it. They won't take the correction. With such a one, no, not eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? Yeah, we're supposed to judge our people in our fellowship. When they start bringing sin and wickedness and doctrines of devils in, we try to correct them, we try to get them back on the right path, they won't listen, we put them out. Why? So we can escape. They don't tempt us. A little leaven leaveth the whole lump. They won't destroy us. Our walk with the Lord. How we, how we stand for this book. Not adding to it, not subtracting from it, rightly dividing. But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourself that wicked person. Proverbs 26.4, 26, we have a huge study on this one for Proverbs 26.4 and 5. 26.4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be also like unto him. Verse 5, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. This isn't a contradiction. This is saying there's a time to answer a fool, and there's a time not to answer a fool. When, a, when someone doesn't want the truth, there's times, brothers of Christ, I've acted foolish. I'm not a fool anymore. Fool said in his heart, there is no God singular. Okay, one true God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. God the Father is the one true God. Now, I've done some things that are foolish. Like trying to resurrect the old man. Getting back into things I'm not supposed to. When, especially when I was newly saved. I've made mistakes. Someone can answer, and I can get a little bit puffed up in my mistake. But someone looks at me and goes, okay, that person loves the Word of God. He loves the truth. He wants the truth. He's acting like a fool. So I'm going to answer a fool according to his folly, lest, uh, uh, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. Get him back to the real wisdom. He's starting to stray over to the world's wisdom. Then you come across somebody who you realize they don't want the truth. They don't believe in absolute truth. They don't want the truth. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. You end up just being someone who bickers and argues and debates, and that's not how we're supposed to be. Here's the truth. Take it or not. Leave it. Matthew 15, 14 says, Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Matthew 7, 6 says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Lest they trample them, that which is holy, those pearls, the wisdom you're trying to give them, the truth, under their feet. And turn again and rend you. We don't force people for the truth. If they don't want the truth, they don't want the truth. We don't force people to do what's right. Here's, there's consequences sometimes for not doing what's right in this world. But I'm talking about as a brother in Christ, if I catch you doing something the Bible says is sin, it might not be illegal in this country, but according to God's word, it's a sin. All right, I'm going to try to reach you for the truth. You don't want the truth? We're done. Let the wicked fall in their own nets. I tried to help you. I tried to warn, warn you about the, the traps that are being set by the world. I tried to warn you about the traps that are being set by your own flesh. Making provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I've tried to warn you. You've turned around and attacked me. you got King David. They've turned around and attacked me. Have you ever come across those people that when you point out something they did wrong, they'll point out five things you did wrong? You're only pointing out the one thing saying, hey, the Lord put it on my heart. I'm just trying to let you know this is what you did. It's not right. It's a sin. You said this. This isn't right. And they'll turn around and point out five things that you did wrong. Well, that could be true. Let's say all five things they point out was right. You're right. Those five things I did, they were wrong. But guess what? It doesn't justify your one thing that I'm pointing out right now. It doesn't make that one thing you did right, and it doesn't hide the one thing you did. 
We need to start being more about correcting one another, taking correction. And bottom line, the hard part is, is when you deal with somebody who doesn't want correction, you put them out of your fellowship. And you wait for them. You still try to correct them, but you put them out of your fellowship till they get their heart right with the Lord. And you always make it so that they can come back. You don't turn around and say, oh, you're a heretic, you're a heathen, you're, you're, you're a false convert, you're a servant of Satan, you're a Jesuit, you're this, you're that, and just go crazy. No, you put them without. I'm talking about for the brother in Christ, the Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman. So when you believe to be a brother in Christ, don't let your anger and bitterness get the better of you, and now he's a lost, false convert. He's a heretic, he's a false convert. You put them without, and you always be there to take them back in when they get their heart right with the Lord. When they get back on the right path. So I'm sorry for this being long, but the expository study, but Brothers of Christ, it comes back to trusting the Lord, fearing God, seeking His Word, seeking to do things His way. And when you fail the Lord, be willing to take correction. Bottom line, if you can dish out correction, you better be able to take it. If you can't take correction, you have no business dishing it out. No business giving him. Now don't get me wrong, there's times, like I said, there's times I get correction from people that can't take it. But I do it for my, God will use it for his glory. But I'm telling you how it's supposed to be for a brother or sister in Christ. You can't, if you can't take correction, you shouldn't be giving it out. And there's men on here, on YouTube, in ministry, that they're getting to the point where they can't seem to take correction. They're better than King David. They're better than all the great... Uh, uh, Moses. Moses had to take correction. He failed the Lord. Struck the rock twice. The second time he was supposed to speak to it, instead he struck it twice. Or he stuck it, struck it the second time. And he had to take correction. Some of the greatest men in the Bible, they had to take correction. Yet, there's men on here that start acting like they're above correction. And don't fall for that lie, that deception that... Oh, I take correction all the time. See, I misspelled, I misspoke this phrase, this verse, or I um, used the wrong address. That's correction, yes, but the correction we're talking about is when you say something that's absolutely wrong in your teaching. When you're, when you're shown that what you're doing is sin, it goes against the Bible. How do you take that correction? Don't be deceived just because someone tells them they used the wrong address, like... 30 days, uh, jo Jonah goes and preaches to those Ninevites that in 30 days, God will destroy Nineveh when the Bible says 40. See, look, he took correction. It's, it's supposed to say 40. No, that's just mis mis using the wrong numbers. True correction is when someone sits there and says, the, the Trinity is truth, and you show them that, A, Trinity is not even in the Bible, and you show them the Word of God, and they go, you know what? I'm supposed to be a Bible believer. I need to say things God's way, and I need to stand by what the Bible actually says and what the Bible actually teaches. I'll take that correction. That brother came across like with John. That wasn't a slip of the word. That wasn't me making a little innocent mistake. I said John was exiled to the island of Patmos. Where does it actually say that? That's taking correction. Okay. There are brethren out there that have the hardest time taking correction, but boy, do they love to give it. And you need to humble yourselves and get back to being, I want to take correction. When I'm wrong, I want to be corrected. And since you don't always know when you're wrong, you can't pick and choose when you want to take correction. Anytime someone's accused me of something, I've studied the issue. Even if I'm right. Even if, I'm sorry, even if I believe I'm right. I'll still study it again, just real quick, and say, okay, did I make any mistakes? Some people say, well, it's because you're doubting yourself. Mm. So if it's a study that's been a while, <laughs> then I will start forgetting some things. That's why we got to stay in the Word. we got to stay in prayer. we got to stay in studies over and over to keep it fresh in your head and in your heart. But for the most part, I'll just, it gets an excuse to go back over something. They attack me on the Godhead. I'll go over the Godhead again. They attack me on the true plan of salvation. I'll go over the true plan of salvation again. They attack me on uh, the day of Christ. Uh, that blessed hope. The day of redemption. They, uh, call, they call it the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. But it's called the day of Christ, the day of redemption, that blessed hope, where we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble, the body of Christ. 
There's some people that still to this day will try to attack me and try to get me over to post a mid-trib. I'll go through and start doing the study and check everything and dot my I's and cross my T's and just to make sure. But this is Christ. Don't get so puffed up and so prideful that you can't take correction. A lot of us are getting that way. There was times in some areas that I got so puffed up and prideful, I wouldn't listen to anybody. And later on down the, the, down the road, God showed me the truth and was like, you know what, that brother was right, and I was being a little too prideful. I wasn't, t I was, because of my pride, I didn't listen to him. Be careful. Take correction when it's, when it's warranted. And if you're getting corrected on something you know is right, use that opportunity to try to lead that person that's correcting you to the truth. But don't be so stubborn and hard-hearted that you don't take any correction. You'll end up to being a very proud, prideful, puffed up. And I've seen great men of God that went from being meek and humble to just being so prideful that you really just can't talk to them anymore. When there's a disagreement, you can't talk to them about any disagreement. Why? They'll blow up on you. So hopefully it's helped, and I'll end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers, and thank you for your support. Remember, open door. I have a ministry email, P.O. box. You can write a letter, and I have, I'm on uh, Skype and Facebook Messenger. If you have a disagree with me, come talk to me. If you believe that I'm not lining up with this book, I'm here, come talk to me. But know that I'm going to hold this as the final authority, and I'm going to talk back. Not talk back like in the bad way, but you know, we're going to have a Bible study, and we're going to find out where the Bible's right, and I'm wrong. But this is the final authority. So grace and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next study.